Hello and welcome to this fireside chat where we are discussing all things organisational matters and community enterprise as part of the 5G New Thinking Toolkit. I am very pleased to be joined today by Paul Gilligan. Uh, Paul, perhaps you could give us a, a quick introduction as to who you are and where you come from. Uh, yeah, of course. Hi, Vicky, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me to this fireside chat. Um, my name is Paul Gilligan. I'm CEO of a charity called Pure Leapfrog. Uh, Pure Leapfrog is a sustainability and decarbonisation charity, and we work with um, communities, local authorities, well-aligned corporates uh, to try and accelerate the uh, progress towards net zero um, targets, um, whilst also having positive social impact in all, all, all the areas that we're active in. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. So, so let's dive straight in. And the first thing I want to ask you is, um, you know, what, what is a community enterprise and why might uh, local communities or rural communities look at establishing one when they're thinking about securing connectivity for their area? Great question. <laughs> really good question. <laughs> um, so what, yeah, what is a community enterprise? Um, so a, a community enterprise um, represents some kind of alternative vehicle or alternative ownership structure mm. uh, is for the benefit of the community or for its members and which is a trading entity and the trading that it undertakes could be for the uh, benefit of its immediate geographic community or it could be for the benefit of members who have aligned in in interests that aren't necessarily geographically um close cl yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so paul that so the, it seems like the idea of this community enterprise then is is, is very much for kind of the, the that benefit and so is that why you know that's that sort of structure would be more appropriate than say a, a sort of a partnership or a limited entity which which people might be kind of more familiar with those sorts of structures I think I think yes. I mean, really, it comes down to um, what do you what do you do with the benefits of trade? Mm -hmm. And any trading that is undertaken is done so in the expectation or in the hope that there might be benefits accrued from undertaking that trade. That some kind of value is added, and that some kind of value is captured. And the question then is, well, what do you do with that? Uh, private companies, PLCs. Um, large corporates that we might be able to go to uh, to stock market and buy shares in yeah. or um, SMEs that are private companies that might be family owned restaurants, for example, the, these um, all sustain people financially and the benefit that is accrued through the trading that is undertaken in those kinds of entities is really essential. It's really important yeah. for economic security and prosperity and you know, um, distribution of wealth, etc. Um, but the the benefits from that are channeled through corporate structures yeah. and existing mechanisms such as shares to produce dividends that that that, that distribute. The benefit of that financial um, of, of the financial surplus of the financial benefit mm. distributes mm. the financial benefit to the holders of those shares. When it comes to community entities, um, what you're looking at is different structures and different mechanisms to distribute the benefit that has been accrued from the trading that has been undertaken back through into the community that you're trying to serve through undertaking trade that you're undertaking. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so um, if we're then, you know, for the, for the viewers that, that might be listening to this today, um, okay, they're looking at kind of securing uh, connectivity for their area. That's clearly looking at kind of a benefit for a community for all the reasons you've just explained a community enterprise feels like the most appropriate kind of structure what then are the different kind of community enterprise organizational structures that are available to communities are there are there various options and and what are the differences in terms of how they operate with you know profits assets distribution of benefits etc 
Sure. So yeah, there, there's there's a whole host of um, of different choices that can be made in terms of the kind of entity that you might incorporate. Um, and when we talk about incorporation, it's the same as any private limited company might do, um, or a PLC. It registers to become a company. It gets treated like um, a person in in law, and it is able to enter into contracts. It's able to own assets, etc. And again, the, the ones that I think people are very familiar with that we would call for profit um, are incorporated using um, a, set of, a set of rules and requirements and obligations and regulation uh, that requires the operators of that company to undertake certain things. Mm -hmm. So um, a private limited company might have say three shareholders and if you distribute profits, then you have to distribute them equally amongst all the shareholders in the same ratio of the shareholding that they have. So you might have one shareholder that's got 70% of the shares, and you may have then two other shareholders that have 15% each. And if you make hundred pounds profit, then you distribute to the 70% shareholder 70 pounds, 15 pounds, yeah. 15 pounds. Um, when it comes to uh, voting, for example, if the company needs to make decisions, then the, uh, the requirements of a private limited company are that uh, the voting should be counted um, commensurate with the shareholding. So the, 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 the person that has 70% of the shares can effectively operate the company and take all of the decisions because they have the majority of the shares mm -hmm. and their 70% counts for more than the combined 30% remaining. Mm -hmm. Within community entities and community, well, within community enterprises, you pick different entity types that essentially uh, get, change that, that, that profit distribution element and change mm -hmm. that decision-making element. And you could have um, you, you could have a, a community interest company that is um, like a like a private limited company. You can have that is limited by guarantee as opposed to limited by share capital. You can have a community interest company that is limited by guarantee. Um, and can you just explain to us what limited by guarantee means for those that might not be familiar with that phrase? Yes. So the um, the operators of the company um, register the company mm -hmm. and they don't put any share capital in to the company. They don't create any shares in it. They don't sell okay. those shares. Um, but the company still needs to have some kind of balance sheet. It, it has to show from day one that it's got some kind of um, financial strength. Mm -hmm. uh, which then can be used to give confidence to anyone else trading with it or lending yeah. money to it or, or anything. And um, when you're limited by guarantee, the members of the company will each guarantee in the event of a collapse of the company to underwrite it to a certain amount. So you could have okay. each member will contribute one pound or each member will contribute £1,000. And that then feeds through to the strength of the balance sheet and allows the company to start trading, giving confidence to those that it trades with. Um, but a, a community interest company, uh, you, you can register it as being um, limited, that, so its liability is limited mm -hmm. to the level of its guarantee. And you can register it um, to, to, to have that guarantee in place, which means there are no shareholders there's just a guarantee that the members will underwrite the liabilities in the event of a crisis. Okay. There's no shareholders. And because it's a community interest company, a regulation that doesn't apply in a private limited company is that uh, it has to exist um, in some way, shape or form to benefit the community that it serves. Okay. And just as a private limited company must file annual returns, accounts, uh, confirmation statements every year. So a community interest company has to do similar things, but when it files its annual returns, 
it has to provide a statement of what it's done, what activities it's undertaken during the year that have been beneficial to the community that it serves. Okay. Okay. Um, you, you can have a community interest company, interestingly, that actually uh, is limited liability through share capital. There are, there are ways of combining this, this idea of community enterprise with the, the, the ability to raise investment through issuing mm. shares. Mm. And so a community interest company that's limited by share capital, you can sell shares in the company and distribute profits as you would with a private company that issues shares. But the way in which you distribute profits is regulated because you're a community interest company and there are limits on the amount of profit that has been made and that, that can then be distributed. Yes, because I suppose that, that the core element is, again, coming back to this whole, the, your raison d'etre is to provide benefit to the community. Completely, completely. Mm -hmm. um, the, the original community enterprises, people may have heard of the Rochdale Pioneers, and the, you know, the original community enterprise is the co-op. Um, and you know, okay. the, the, the co-op that we think of today, is, it's a really significant business. Mm. And that started, um, that, that, that started by a group of people getting together, essentially saying that we, we're gonna be, we're gonna be stronger together um, and we can take on the interests of um, a much smaller group of more narrowly financially interested people that operate um, in, you know, that, 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 that operate their businesses in our local area. Um, and we, we can come together and try and do similar, but for the benefit of, of all of us. Mm. And I mean, essentially, Essentially, community enterprises, in, in our experience, tend to exist either because there's an incentive for them to do so. Um, so, again, in, in an area that we're very active in, which is community energy, there's been a subsidy for a great number of years that mm. people may have heard of called the feed-in tariff, where the government was incentivizing the, um, the, 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 the deployment of renewable generation, so wind, uh, solar, and for every kilowatt hour that you produce of energy, they would pay you an extra amount. So there's a real incentive there incentive, that got yeah. communities together to say, yeah, well, let's, let's build our own. Um, and we as a community can own it and we will get those payments and we can use those payments to um to do other good things mm. in our communities so it's usually it usually arises because there is um there is an incentive or that there's an unmet need and mm. if we go back to the rochdale pioneer pioneers there was an unmet need when they first established themselves they said something like we, we, we're going to we're going to form arrangements to undertake trade for the pecuniary benefit of our members, mm. but also for the, the, the improvement of the, the social and domestic conditions that our members live in. So that mm. idea of community benefit was baked in from the very earliest um, formation of, of um, community enterprise. And, and that was very much about unmet need. They, you know, if, if it's for the improvement of social and domestic conditions, then social and domestic conditions weren't very good. And we had on that, that's why they started trading. So we see it when there's an incentive and we see it when there's an unmet need. And talking of unmet need, rural connectivity seems to fall very firmly into the, into the centre of, of, of that. Yeah, completely. Um, and un, unmet need, uh, we, we might also call market failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and... We, we know that um, governments do get concerned about market failure when they're not working, you know, when, when markets aren't working for everyone. And particularly when it is concerning uh, what we now consider to be a basic utility. Um, yeah. We would all be very concerned if we, we heard of people uh, in, in the UK living in conditions where they didn't have clean running water or 
access to energy <laughs> yeah of course and very sadly it's the case in many parts of the world yeah um and there's there's lots of great work that goes on to address those inequalities but if we heard about it in the uk we'd be shocked absolutely and actually, connectivity and access to the internet is quickly it's becoming become, the same it's becoming the same it's, it's a utility yeah. and it is re it's required in order to um, participate in mm. many of the conventions and structures of social interaction that we have in the modern world. It's required to underpin a lot of um, commerce and, and, and you know, the, the economic activity that flows from that. Yeah. Um, digital exclusion comes at a, a significant cost to, to many communities. And so you start to see this, this market failure emerges because um, the, the existing dominant players, uh, the, 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 the mobile network operators, they all have to, they all have to put in these eye-watering bids to buy the rights to use certain radio spectrum. Mm -hmm. And these run into the many billions that they're prepared to pay government in order to uh, be able to operate their, their, their wireless services. Um, and they need to get a return on that investment. Course, <laughs> nobody nobody yeah. would expect them not to. Yeah. And, and, and the money that they're investing very often gets lent to them by pension funds that mm -hmm. ordinary people have put their life savings into. So, you know, it's not a bad thing that, that, that this investment is being made and that return on investment is expected. It's, it's really not a bad thing. But of course. where are they going to get their highest returns soonest? Are they going to get their highest returns on, uh, on deploying their new infrastructure to deliver these new services on this newly available frequency range? Are, are they going to get their, their best return on investment in a highly dense, densely populated area or in a low density populated area? Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. It's, it's, you know, it's market conditions and it's totally understandable, isn't it, as you say? Um, coming back to those organisational structures, so we, we've talked around sort of community interest um, uh, entities and what other structures might there be available that um, people watching might need to be aware of? Sure. So, I mean, you, you can get, um, you get the, the two flavours of community interest company that we discussed, the, 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 the by, by guarantee and by share capital. Mm -hmm. um, you get, uh, you, you can have a simple um, private limited company limited by guarantee, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't confer on it any of the additional obligations, such as taking into account the community interest or restricting how it can use its money or handle its assets. Um, you get uh, the industrial and provident societies. So uh, that, that's old fashioned terminology for um, a, a co-op, a cooperative. So okay. usually you get a members cooperative or you get a workers cooperative. Again, mm -hmm. the, the, these businesses exist and they're large and they're, they're kind of hiding in plain sight. In plain sight, so, yes, yeah. John Lewis. Great example. It's yeah. a workers cooperative. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and if you look at uh, a huge insurer in the UK, Liverpool, Victoria, um, again, it's, it's an industrial and provident society. It's a members society. Mm. We, mm. We, we, we think of the RAC and the AA, they're not anymore, but they used to be owned by their members. Building oh, interesting. owned by yeah. their members. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's, there's, there's a lot more great, of it around than you realise. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not just um, the, the, the kind of the hyper-local where we might think of something like um, a community shop. Mm, mm. Um, again, this is arising because of unmet need. Um, nobody wanted to operate the post office anymore and suddenly the shop closed and you can't get your milk and your bread and yeah. actually it's not just about being able to get your milk and your bread it's about walking along there in the morning and seeing um you know mrs goggins from three doors down and, and just seeing that she's okay and yeah and, actually she, and saying good morning to her and you might be the only person that she sees maybe until five in the evening when her son pops around and, and that yeah. makes a difference. That, you know, it, it does. These, these pieces of, of community structure are what help build strong communities. Definitely. And they're really, really important. So they, 
that there are these huge community enterprises or, or, or alternatively owned uh, businesses. And there are these really kind of hyper-local ones. Mm. Um, and then to, to, to finish the list, sorry, the, the, other, the, the other industrial and provident society type that you have in the modern world is called a community benefit society, mm -hmm. uh, which is often shortened to BENCOM. Okay. And a community benefit society, again, um, it exists for the benefit of the community that it serves. It exists for the benefit of its members. It doesn't have shareholders. It, it, okay. it, so we, we often think of profit and not for profit, but I think in terms of profit and surplus, okay. and for me, a profit only exists where you have a mechanism through which you can distribute it to mm -hmm. shareholders. Anything else is a surplus. Okay. If you don't have shareholders, you don't have, pro this is the way I think of it, you don't have profits, you don't have individuals that you can distribute those profits to, but you can trade and create a surplus. So that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah. What, do you, um, what do you do with the benefit of the, that is created through the trade that you're undertaking? And in a community benefit society, you are required to undertake trade for the benefit of the community that you serve. So it's a real, and it's a democratic organization. So the community that you serve is able to contribute to running the organization and can expect um, representation, membership within the organization and the decision-making of the organization itself. When it comes down to a vote, every member has one vote. So because you don't- Much more democratic, vote, yeah. Because you don't have the shareholding, you don't have the 70%, 30%, one, mm -hmm. you don't have the power concentrated in a way that is aligned with where the capital to undertake the trading has come from. You have the, the, the power is evenly distributed. Yeah. The membership of yeah. the community benefit society. And so it means that everyone that is a member has an equal say and an equal stake in the decisions that are being made. Um, and yeah, I think that that probably wraps up main alternative different types. ownership yeah. in different community enterprise kind of. It's really interesting. And I think, as you say, it's really interesting that you know, you, we tend to think of this in terms of those very small, immediate local needs, but actually there are some huge examples, which is, um, you know, I think quite eye-opening when you realize that. Um, going back to what you were saying there on the Bencom about you know it being very democratic, democratic, everybody gets one vote. In the reality of actually everyone agreeing and getting things done, that sounds like it could potentially also be quite challenging. So, what sort of governance processes do um, viewers need to be thinking about? So, governance. Um, sorry, I shifted about a bit there. Um, That's okay. Just pause for a moment. Um, so, what kind of governance processes do we need to be thinking about? I, I mean, governance is is very important. It's very important for any organisation. Mm. Um, and I think about governance as being um, it's how you achieve the purpose of your organisation through having clear processes, policies. Um, reporting, so transparency, uh, and then we're you know, reporting what you're doing, how you're doing it, how well you're doing. Um, risk management, so that you're again you're, you're assessing what the risks to your organisation are, um, and being open about that, and being democratic about any decisions that might need to be taken to um, to, to, to manage that risk. And and essentially, it's you you draft your own rules mm. that that are drafted in a way to help meet the aims and the purpose of your organization and then you stick to them and, yeah. and, and as we were talking about earlier these different um incorporation types the kip the bencom the the co-op uh, these different incorporation types kind of come ready packaged mm. with their own very low level very basic fundamental governance requirements so um, things such as asset locks, things 
such as uh, the way in which voting occurs, profit distribution, etc. You know, the, the baked into the entity itself um, is this kind of fundamental element of governance. But then, it, it you know, it leaves an awful lot up for grabs in terms of mm. how do you how do you build on top of that? What other policies and, and rules do you put in place that you will hold yourselves to and that actually your members will hold you to as an organization yeah. or yeah. should hold you to as an organization um what what do you put on top of that in order to really um shore up or strengthen the the chances of your community enterprise being successful in mm. these things and that can thing then yeah that can be things like considering questions of you know, who makes up your community? Um, yes. Who, you know, who are the key stakeholders and community leaders that you might mm. actually want to consult with whilst you're thinking about or preparing to set something up? Um, how do we represent everyone? Uh, what, what, what's the, what is the leadership of our organisation? Who is the leadership of, of the proposed organisation? And, and how is that leadership chosen? How often is that leadership mm. chosen? Um, questions around do we distribute surpluses through a community benefit fund or do we plan to uh, reinvest so that we can um, so, so that we can increase what we're already doing mm -hmm. um, yeah. trade more or diversify maybe mm. move into mm. other areas um, and yeah, how, do, how do we ensure that decisions that we take now are in the best interests of our members now and our future members in the future and all of these questions uh, need exploring uh, if you're going to set up a, a successful community enterprise yeah. from the outset these questions are really important they need exploring you need to understand your local community what um what the motivation for for establishing a community entity is are you trying to meet an unmet need is it that there's an incentive to do so and that there's an opportunity to you know get you know money coming into your community for the wider benefit of the community but um why is it that you're doing this who is it going to serve how are they going to be represented how do you engage with them how do you ensure that there is the um the, the access to to membership to the to the right you know the, to, to the whole community to, the, to yeah. the cohort that you're addressing and how do we codify that into a set of rules and, and policies and how are we transparent about those rules and policies to ensure that we stick to what we said we were going to do yeah, and how we were going to do it? Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like we're essentially saying there's kind of two key pieces of advice when it comes to governance. The first is to, to really make sure that you think about the type of organisational structure that you choose up, up front to make sure that, that that takes you part of the way there. And there's lots of information on the toolkit that helps to kind of explain in, in more detail and build on what Paul's been talking us through. And the second is then recognizing that that only takes you part of the way there and to really invest the time up front in thinking about and answering all of those questions that you out, outlined there so that you're, you're setting yourself up for success from day one, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And so the final thing I wanted to talk to you about is, um, and viewers watching this might not realize, but the, the toolkit is essentially based on um, real world experience. So um, we have looked at um, developing and deploying connectivity in the Orkney Islands, uh, one of the worst connected places in the UK. And as part of that, um, the 5G New Thinking project set up a Bencom, didn't it, Paul? And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what, what actually we've done in Orkney and, and how you see that, that sort of working and, and evolving going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, this is a really good opportunity to be able to talk about the, the, the successes of Bencoms um, and some of the challenges of them as well and how they can be used to start to address the needs of a community. Um, in in this project, uh, there was there was government funding available, and part of the scope of the project was to uh, to, to create a, a a small amount of telecoms infrastructure that is fifth generation cellular telecoms five G, and to start to operate that uh, that infrastructure to test certain 
um, use cases for it because it's not what we're talking about now but you know obviously 5g is huge enabling technology mm -hmm. and there's uh, any any amount of really novel and interesting applications for it that go way beyond sending a text message or surfing the, the, the web or you know we're, we're starting to get into internet of things yeah and 5g enabled ambulances so you know connecting to a, a surgeon at the hospital uh, monitoring of um, agriculture aquaculture that there's lots of use cases so yeah. this test bed was was created um, in in, in, in a, one of the islands in a small part of, of, of Orkney um, and it was created so that we could test a few of these applications of 5G that, that, that might exist in the future. But what we also did, and this is the, this is the really, really good part, because um, the, 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 the test bed is there for, uh, for, the, for the applications rather than the community at the moment. Because the, the capital required for establishing this kind of infrastructure is, is huge. Mm. Um, and just for a very small amount of it, it can run into the multiple millions. And if a community is looking to meet their own unmet needs with connectivity, they need to be able to understand what are all the revenue streams that can be exploited in the future that will de-risk this investment and ensure financial success mm. and going ability to meet the community needs. And that's why these use cases are being, being tested. But when it comes to general open access to the network to improve the general connectivity of Orcadians, the step that we've taken alongside establishing the infrastructure is to say, we're going to create a Bencom right now. Mm. Within the project, we're going to create a community benefit society that we're going to put a lot of these assets into. So already through the, the, the innovation funding that's been received from government to test these use cases, we've then taken it that little step further and said, well, we're going to take the, the infrastructure, the assets that that funding has funded for one reason we're going to take those assets and we're going to keep them mm -hmm. for the benefit of the community in the future so now there's a community benefit society in Orkney that owns some 5g infrastructure there are now immediately from this point onwards there are opportunities to exploit that infrastructure yeah. that's in that part of Orkney to start to um, try and, and, and build a business case to be able to make it more openly accessible for general telecoms use for mm -hmm. the people that are able to connect to it in, in, in that vicinity, you know, as far as the radio waves extend, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not a physicist <laughs> or, or a technology. You know, yeah. But you know, and, and so there is this, there is there, there, there is this newly incorporated entity that owns assets that has a balance sheet that can start trading as and when it's, it decides to do so, to exploit those assets for the benefit of the community. Um, and people, you know, people will still expect to pay for these services. You don't provide yeah, them for free, it's, it's trading. Yeah. And people anywhere would expect to pay for their, you know, their phone bill. Yeah. Uh, for internet access etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's just it's, it's a community-owned organization that owns the assets that is providing the service that then gets the revenues from uh, from its customers yeah but also most likely its members who yes, may also, true, yes. yeah. who may also be shareholders and there's a, there's a whole other piece um, that we've we've looked at in the toolkit uh, around funding and financing mm -hmm. and um, one one of the um, one of the ways in which Bencoms can raise money uh, and, and finance to invest in in assets and then to use as working capital is to issue um, what are called community shares. So they're very different to the shares we've been talking about earlier. Yeah. It doesn't mean you own a bit of the company. They're very very different. But but very often 
if somebody from the community invests in community shares, it automatically makes them a member. So your yeah. customers are your customers are your members who each get democratic say in how yeah. you operate. They're your shareholders who have given you the capital to be able to operate. They're giving you the revenues to underpin your cash flows so that you remain financially viable as you trade and to create a surplus that can go into a community benefit fund that can come back out into the community mm. by way of grants, for example, to yeah. maybe um, assist the, you know, the most vulnerable or uh, very often, Bencoms will um, make available their surpluses in the, in the form of community benefit funds uh, in ways that are thematically aligned to mm. the area they're trading in. So, for mm. example, in, in the Bencom in Orkney, what we can look at is creating a community benefit fund that may, for example, award grants to those who are most digitally excluded. Fantastic. So you get this wonderful kind of virtuous cycle that, that, that sort of happens, which is great. And, you know, it's one of the things that I think is, is so great about this toolkit is that it is, you know, we really have been eating our own dog food, as, as for one of the better phrase of, of, of kind of doing these things, trying them out. And, and you know, I would really encourage people to, to take the time to read through the toolkit and to access all the content in there because it's all based on um, the, the huge amount of expertise, but also real world experience, which is, which is so, so important. Completely. And I think virtuous circle is a really, really important way of looking at it. Um, and and I'm, re I'm really pleased that you, you know, that you mentioned it because all of the benefits we've been talking about, all of the, the meet a community meeting its own needs, um, being democratic in the way in which it decides on how to operate its own community mm -hmm. structures and, and community enterprises, um, being some of the providers of capital that's needed, you know, all, all, all of these, all of these things allow an entity to trade that provides the services, that provides the community benefit, it has a really positive social impact. Uh, but at the same time, in this instance, it is uh, facilitating economic growth, because as we were discussing earlier, Vicky, the um, digital exclusion, the lack of connectivity in some of these rural places excludes uh, these places from participating in many of the economic opportunities that technology yes. affords us. So it, it, it addresses that, which is fantastic. The, the last bit it addresses, and, and why your comment about virtuous circle I think is so good, is um, it, it keeps money within the community. Yeah. You've not got it flying out to yeah. um, foreign ownership of, of utility companies. It keeps it not only in the UK, um, and I, you know, I, I don't mean to be sort of, um, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to sort of suggest that there's anything wrong with global capitalism or, you know, capitalism is the application of capital um, to labor, to you know, generate extra value and, and spread mm -hmm. wealth, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so nothing wrong with that. But what happens when you keep, um, what, what happens when you keep money in a local community is what economists call a, a multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, many, again, many viewers may have, um, may have seen signs written or photos of signs that have been on social media um, about supporting um, local independent businesses and, and retailers. You yes. see signs on Able, yes. things like yes. this, saying, "We you know, one pound spent in this coffee shop equals you know, somebody's wage, and they then spend this." And you know, yes. this is the multiplier effect. It's yeah. um, it's keeping the money in the local community, and it's not. It doesn't just directly benefit in the ways that we've been talking about, but it then indirectly benefits by rippling out and being spent again and again and again mm, into the mm. community, and it has this multiplier effect. Fantastic. Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, so interesting to kind of delve into um, everything to do with community enterprises and, and the huge amount of opportunities that um, they can offer to rural communities in particular, looking at taking control of their own connectivity. Thank you very much, Paul. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, best of luck with, uh, with everything else to do with the toolkit. Um, we, you know, we, we really look forward to supporting in, in any way with we can um, towards the end of the project, more toolkit and 
thereafter as well. So yeah, thank you, Vicky. Brilliant, thank you.